Hello, good evening and welcome. In the words of David Frost, my name is Chris Packham. I'm a naturalist, a broadcaster and an environmental campaigner for much of my time these days. But for the next 50 minutes or so, I'd been very kindly invited by Waterstones and Macmillan, the publishing house, to have a conversation with one of their young authors. And before I introduce him, I'm just going to tell you a bit about what we're going to be doing. We're going to be talking a bit about his recent book, of course, and there will be opportunities for you to uh, buy that book. It was published on the 8th of July. Um, you'll be wanting a copy if you haven't got one already, certainly by the time we finish our conversation. The best place to direct you to to secure one of those, because they've still got some signed copies left, is the Waterstones website. But hold your fingers off those keypads for at least the next 50 minutes, otherwise you'll miss our chat. And there are plenty left. Now, throughout the course of our discussion, um, you can ask us questions. We're not going to answer them until the end, otherwise it might interrupt our flow. If we ever get any flow going, let's hope so. Uh, but at the bottom of your screens, if you're using Zoom, which I presume you are, of course, um, you'll see there's a little tab there that you can click on and ask a question. And towards the end, I'll leave 10 minutes or so, depending on how many questions I see that we're getting, and we'll try and get through uh, those questions. Don't pose the questions uh, to me. Let's try and keep most of those for my guest. Now, my guest this evening is uh, a unique young man. Uh, I say that with uh, absolute assurity. Uh, I met him on social media. One of the uh, benefits of social media is that we are able to meet people that we share views, opinions or likes with. Um, obviously, it has its downsides, but it's got plenty of upsides too. And through that media, we began communicating and eventually we had the pleasure of meeting one another in the flesh and starting what has been a, well, sometimes broken uh, conversation due to our busy lives and, of course, more recently, COVID, meaning that we we haven't been able to move around as much as we might have liked, but for very good reasons. Now, the young man I'm talking about is the one and only Dara McNulty. Uh, he heralds from Northern Ireland. He's a, a teenager uh, there. Um, and rather like myself, he's been diagnosed with autism. And I think that this might have given him a unique ability to look at the natural world in a way that many other people can't. His first book, uh, Diary of a Teenage Naturalist, was a great success. It won all sorts of plaudits and prizes too, I'm pleased to say, all of which were richly deserved. But most importantly, they, I must start off by telling you that aside from all of this, Dara is actually a fantastic young bloke. And he's pincefully fueled his fantasticism because of his deep-rooted and great passion for wildlife, which so many of us share. So I can't ask you to put your hands together since you're all muted and we're doing this virtually, but in your minds at least, summon a round of applause for Dara. Dara, good evening. Good evening, Chris. Hello. Um, thank you so much. Like any compliments sort of makes me want to cringe a little bit inside. <laughs> uh, but you know what? I'll take them for, the, for, for this moment. Um, but it's great to actually get talking again. It's like, it's been so long. Um, I know. We, we were at the Science Festival in, yeah. in your neck of the woods, obviously. Uh, that was well over a year ago, of course, yeah. when we last met face wow. to face. <laughs> and you were working on on, on this book um, yeah. at that time, I believe, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I was. I was. And it was sort of in its beginnings at that point. I hadn't really even it was like sort of like a side project at that point but it grew into something a lot bigger and um, something that I really really got into um as it passed as it went along okay well before we get on to the book let's get on to the fuel um that got you up in the morning to write it and as I've already mentioned you do have a, a, an enormous passion for wildlife and you've had it from a young age you're still a very tender young age of course if you don't mind me saying but I'm a 60 year old 60th birthday I didn't get your card mate what happened to that <laughs> <laughs> and if, anyway look I, let's not digress into who sent who cards because i don't suppose you got mine either because i'm not terribly good at birthday cards um the uh, but what, what how did you get into wildlife in the first place can you remember that far back honestly i really can't remember uh, that far back like um my first memories were of nature of being in belfast um scrubbing around trying to find all sorts of things i lived in a city that wasn't really that biodiverse so it was mostly feathers and pigeons um and then going into ormo park and 
um, finding squirrels and and conkers and pine cones and just being fascinated by all of those small little things that I could find within the confines of the city. And those are my probably my happiest memories were of that time where I just sort of could embrace and see all the nature that was around me and the joy that that gave me and it seeing all of those creatures around me and then all of the little details that I was so fascinated by um by finding little beetles that lived inside the pine cone and then studying the um those beetles was just something that utterly fascinated me a couple of other quick questions whilst we're on you know the origins of this interest um when i was your age i had to catch things and keep things you know i had to have tadpoles in a jam jar and you know caterpillars in another jam jar alongside them w were you into keeping and rearing and watching all of those animals in a similar way um i think i have like sometimes if something really caught my attention i would keep it um I had a really, um, I think all of my siblings had a really fond fascination of keeping snails. Uh, <laughs> but honestly, I just enjoyed watching them. And I was sort of like, I would bring back um, inanimate objects, mostly um, dead things a lot. Um, they were most because I, I wasn't quick enough to usually catch them. <laughs> so mostly they, um, they were dead when they came back. Um, uh, because I could only find them that way. Um, so lots and lots of feathers. Um, I remember getting um, the pine cones and the conkers, um, lots of scat, um, random uh, random pieces of scat that I could find. Um, just finding anything that could sort of pique my interest. Okay, okay. Um, Next question. Um, yeah. have, have you still got it all? Because um, I've got a house full of small boxes and plastic containers filled full of feathers and scat, I have to tell you. I, I presume you've got quite a collection. I do have a lot of it still. It's mostly still there. Most of it, I have to say, because we just moved again, is in the, like, in the garage. And, like, there is entire, like, you know, like those cardboard boxes? There is entire boxes dedicated to all of that stuff to collected by three siblings over like um one and a half decades it's a it's a lot of it's a lot a of lot random of stuff. a lot of scat you've got in there yeah i've got many many cartons of it um like i've um you know like um this those little um plastic little carton things so, oh my god there's so many of them um but i do i do keep a lot of it i i really can't let it go it's it's kind of bad. <laughs> and well, look, I've got I've got stuff that I've had since I was your age and younger, and I'm, as I said, I'm sixty and I've still got it. It's it's no longer under my bed where it used to live. It is now in a in a, in a sort of a in a cupboard with a with, with yeah. a lot of shelf space. Um, okay, we'll, we'll move on to the book almost immediately. But I do want to ask you one more thing because we haven't met up um, recently. Then, so it's been an unusual spring. I know you've been out and about. I've been following yeah. your tweets, obviously on social media. What's the highlight? Your natural history highlight of the year so far? Ooh. So I've been I've been out quite a bit. Um, so um, like I said, I've been I, I I did move house again. So now I'm by the coast, and so um, and so I'm seeing all of the marine life at the moment. And I remember, so I was looking into rock pools. And usually, when you look into rock pools, you mostly see like maybe a, if you're really lucky, you might see like a shrimp. Mostly, it's just limpets and crabs. <laughs> Um, but I saw sea hare um, when I was looking at one, and I was just like, Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, 
Fantastic yeah. things. And, yeah. and that brings us on. I mean, your passion for finding your first sea hare, which I remember yes. myself many years ago, because they are so difficult to see. And you, you, well, you see them in the books on, well, on yeah. the pop calling, and you fantasize about finding them. When you yeah. find, find one, yeah, you, you know why you haven't seen one. Um, but, yeah. you know, the book that you've written is, is very much about, you know, uh, getting young people to connect in the way that you've just described um, with something like a, a sea hare. They don't feature directly in the book, but there are plenty of other fascinating things in here. Uh, tell me a bit about why you decided to take this approach. This is your second published book and the first one was very different without yeah. going into too much detail about that one because we're on this one today. Um, yeah. It was a diary. Um, it was extremely emotive and and yeah. and you know very descriptive opening up not just your you know sharing your your, your views and vision, but also very much your your passion and trials and tribulations. But this one is is a is is all about grabbing young people and and getting them into wildlife isn't it yeah so this book it, it is a very very different book um to what i had because honestly i just wanted to write a happy book um like diary like it, it's it's cool and all but like there's some like it's it's my life and it, some bits i do, i feel uncomfortable with even today and I just wanted to write something really happy that just sort of went back to the child's childish wonder of the natural world that I look back on quite fondly and trying to re-experience all of those original memories, um, all of those things that I um, haven't really thought about in, in years and trying to put myself back into young Dara and trying to go for it all again for a literary sense and then also be able to do it in pictures so we get incredible art as well yeah um, yeah you, you obviously happened very fortuitously of course yeah. uh, barry falls and the oh, artwork is 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 delightful it's sublime uh, let's have a look at one of the spreads because i think we can have a look at yeah what the book actually looks like because it um it is very much about uh, you know, it, communicating visually as well as by, by the word. It's very inviting. It's warm yes. and, and enthusiastic. Tell me a bit about how you and Barry worked together to produce these. Um, so basically how it worked was because um, uh, the lockdown was upon us, um, everything was quite remote. So we were sort of, I sent him words, he sent me back images and we sort of had like this to and fro. Um, there, so there was lots of little things as it sort of, formed like it's the the window originally was a lot higher up um and so there but I, but we wanted to get a little bit more like it sort of evolved as i as the words and the picture sort of melded together i'd also like to note in every single one of like the entry um spreads to the section rosie does appear um it was like something that i always that i really wanted like some bit of continuity between all of the the main spreads which this is, is the, this is your 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 trusty hound of course yes this is my trusty hound she's out for a walk at the moment but so I, but i would show her but she's she's a she's out um probably causing some no amount of pain by stopping and sniffing <laughs> but if only we had the nose of a dog for a day i often say if only, imagine if only. Yeah. So look, the, the books, it, it, there yeah. is a, a narrative structure as well as a mission. It, it starts indoors and we can see the spread here where you're, you're asking a, a young person to drag a chair to the window and, and move from the inside out, but without physically leaving, just peering through the, yeah. the, the glass. And it's a gentle introduction to, to getting people to, to look yeah. at the nature that's around them, isn't it? Yeah, it's this sort of um, way that you can sort of look at nature sort of passively i get it's sort of like you can sort of just look out your window and see all the nature that's out there a sort of a sort of introduction to it i like i wanted to make it feel quite inviting um not as some i feel like it with quite a bit of uh nature it's sort of nature writing it sort of jumps into like mountains and deep into forests almost immediately and so i which is kind of inaccessible for quite a lot of people. So I wanted to start in the home, start in the place that we're most comfortable with to try and sort of invite us into this incredible beauty of the natural world. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like Darwin on the wall. Uh, yes, and that was, funny enough, that was in the original. That was 
that's been sticked through through <laughs> thick and thin. I, I imagine that your own bedroom wall probably has undertones posters on it, and and, and maybe not yeah. so much of Charles Darwin, but that may be, may not fit the way. Yeah, it's just something that we um kind of wanted to do. Um, and Barry does have an incredible level of detail, like. Honestly, you know those books down there, they probably have like title names on them that I haven't <laughs> looked close enough to see yet. Because funnily enough, um uh, on the actual diary, on the diary um cover, um, if you look really close into the backpack onto one of the badges on the backpack, it actually says undertones on it. Um <laughs> It's which is like just amazing. A badge of credibility in more ways than one. Um, yeah. the, the, the book has, I, I saw it as having four principal components. Firstly, you've got this underlying encouragement. You're trying to encourage, yes. uh, encourage young people to engage with, with wildlife, starting indoors, yes. moving into the garden, and then, yes. and as you say, to further flung, pla uh, flung places like forests and, and mountains. Uh, the second thing is this poetic writing to introduce each set of the species that you've chosen to highlight those habitats or environments if you like then you've got identify the species and a bit of information about them and then behind that as well you've got um you know some broader topics haven't you things like metamorphosis you know it's no it, you, you introduce people to the idea of going to look for tadpoles but then tell them what tadpoles are, are, are really about and one of yeah. the others is migration yes. uh, which you, you've looked at as well yeah, it was, um, I kind of wanted, um, I think there's a slide um, that we've got um, for that. Um, so basically what I wanted to do was introduce um, some, I guess, scientific concepts into a, a children's picture book because honestly, I believe that the curriculum when it comes to the sciences in primary schools is pretty lacking. Like I didn't learn science until I hit secondary school. Um, like we were, when we were, I remember very clearly we were given out like lo loads of worksheets and one of them was maths, one of them was English and one of them was like a science worksheet. And we were told to cross out the science worksheet because it wasn't on the transfer test. Um, you guys don't have the transfer test over in England but we still have it here, bloody hell. Uh, <laughs> but, it was, it's sort of like this frothling of the sciences. And it means that when people come into secondary school, they're like completely lost in this sea of information. And I just wanted to like show that topics can be introduced in a way that can be comprehended by uh, young children. And that are pretty interesting. Like migration um, is a pretty interesting topic and you don't really learn about it at all. Like. Honestly, I don't think it's on our curriculum at all, even in A-level. It's insane. It, it, it is insane, uh, not just for the science, but also for the wonder that you mentioned. Oh, yeah. It is all, all inspiring, you know, looking at those species that you've chosen there, Arctic terns, swift swallows and hooper swans. Um, the mo most remarkable journeys across the, you know, skin of our planet to get from one place to another necessarily. It, it's, it's, it's just the sort of thing that should awe yeah. young people. You know, as well as interest them, basically. Yeah, and like also the, the facts that eels go into migration as well. Like I chucked that one in as well. The um, them going to the Sargasso Sea. Like most people don't even know that eels migrate at all. So mm. I just wanted to toss in all these little bits of information mm. um, that are they're just sort of they're like it's like it's not obviously at the complexity where it's, it probably would be usually. But something that's just nice and introductory to the topic of migration or the topic of metamorphosis or so on, so on. I guess the thing is, you know, it's about stimulating young people's interest, isn't it? Yeah. Really? And, and, you know, and leaving them with questions to be answered. I mean, that's yeah. the thing for, for people like you and I, we've got, a, we know full well that we've got a lifetime of questions to be answered. We're never going to even ask them all, let alone answer them. Yeah. All. Um, and that's one of the joys of our pursuit, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. And having all those questions like I take in a question and trying to find the answers and then trying to work my way through all of these problems some people don't really get that it's sort of like it becomes like this brick wall um which sometimes happens a lot in the sciences like it, it's being like they come up to the sciences and it's just this massive brick wall of questions that they've never really been exposed to before they've never been taught how to ask a question properly, um, how to 
put into their mind how to go, okay, uh, how do I work through a problem? And then they're confronted by everything at once. And so I just wanted to sort of get people into the mindset of just being able to ask questions that are essential about our world. And it's probably pretty essential. We need to ask some serious questions at the moment. I think um, we can't argue with that. Um, I, yeah. I think another thing that, you know, we adults, um, you know, forget to ask even the most fundamental questions, I think. I mean, you know, I, I bet we, we could go onto the street and today and, and ask people, you know, why is the sky blue? Why do stars sparkle? I mean, you know, those things that we would think to ask as, as children when we see them yes. for the first time. But yeah. by the, if you haven't got the answers by the time of the adult, you, you never you forget to ask those questions. You yeah. go through the whole of your life not knowing why those things are that way. And I, I personally find that staggering. I, yeah. I like those fundamental questions. I feel like people get scared um, almost of questions as they get older um, because it, they've been... I feel like there's a heavy teaching in, in schools at the moment that failure, that getting something wrong is bad. Um, like if you get something wrong in the test, you're marked down. You're given like a uh, like an F or a D, which just feels awful. So getting wrong is like conditioned into us to be bad, um, which it isn't. It's getting wrong is the first step to finding out what's actually correct. Um, and so we almost like go, well, shouldn't I know what color the sky? Why the color um, the color of the sky is blue? Um, everybody else probably knows that. I shouldn't ask that because I'll look stupid. Uh, and so they never asked. And then nobody knows. <laughs> it was like, and that's how probably knowledge sort of gets lost. In... I'm, I'm, I'm really tempted to break in now and, and explain to everyone why the sky is blue, but I'm, yeah. I'm not going to do that because that's not our mission tonight. Let, let's, no. let's take a look at another one of the, the spreads. Um, because again, you know, they, they are very beautifully done and very oh, yeah. uh, beautifully com composed. And, and yes. part of them, as I said, you, you, once you've captured people's interest, young people's interest, you, 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 you give them practical things to do, don't you? And this one's pond dipping. Yes, this one, very, very enjoyable um, to... to see the artwork on this one, getting to identify all the little creatures in there. Um, and the pond dip, like doing the activities, um, I wanted them to all be like base, pretty simple activities because sometimes you get into an activity book to do in nature and they're like, um, there's some pretty insane stuff like um, make a bird box or something. And most people don't have basic woodworking skills. Um, so I wanted to make some stuff that was you can just sort of go out with very little equipment. Like for that, for pond dipping, you only really need the net, the a little white tub and wellies, and you can sort of- Oh, well, wellies, wellies aren't mandatory. I'll tell you, I've been in the- Wellies are not mandatory. Day, and I, and I have very wet feet and thighs. So. I have done that. <laughs> I have done that. I think I had to do that one for um, like, technically because of legal reasons but uh, it's please. like okay say that. Uh, well we can say unofficially to any young people who might be watching that getting wet feet is not a crime and not and, and always treading mud into, onto your parents carpet because Absolutely. that mud has come from somewhere more, more interesting than that carpet that's all, all, all we can say so yeah fantastic stuff so get, yeah. get getting these young people out introducing to these you know very uh, you know i would say every day in terms of their occurrence tackle, yeah. water snails um caddis fly but then the other thing that you do is go behind the scenes of the cat things, some of these species like the caddis fly, and, and show us how wondrous they are in terms of their yeah. life cycle, their lifestyle. And yeah, so then I put in the fact sections, and honestly, those were the funnest bits of the book to do. Um, I don't know if we've got a slide of the fact sections here, um, but they were honestly... The, uh, this is like another broad topic here of the metamorphosis. But it's a challenging uh, one, actually. Metamor metamorphosis is something which, again, yeah. a lot of people don't ever get to grips with. And yeah. you've got two different types of metamorphosis here. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to show one that's sort of that's done with the beetles, and then one that's done with uh, dragonflies. I kind of wanted to stay away from the usual butterfly, and um, because every like it's sort of something. Everybody's read like the hungry caterpillar or something. <laughs> so I wanted to show that, yeah, ladybirds do it as well. And so do dragonflies um, and, and also frogs. Uh, <laughs> and they go through like, and then try to sort of show that the, 
um, trying to demystify all of these little quirks of nature. Um, I just want to talk a little bit more about like the fact sections. Um, I don't think we actually have a slide of one here. I can actually maybe I can just like. Well, I think we've got that slide of which was one of my favourite spreads. I don't know if we can go to that one, which was oh uh, yeah the one uh, with the birds on the birds on it. Yes. Yeah, I think that was might have been. The, I think we, that was the next. Clue, what was the last one? Um, here we one. are. Yes, this is it. This is one of the fact sections, and honestly, this one was an absolute joy because I got to do, um. Anybody who knew me as a young child, actually still to this day, knows that my favorite free words was, did you know? Uh, <laughs> and oh my God, I pestered everybody with random facts. And I get to pester everybody with all the facts <laughs> in this book. Um, so I got to put in all of the weird and wonderful little facts, um, like the fact that only male goldfinches eat teasel um, because they've got a specially adapted beak that allows them to eat on them. And then the way that uh, coal tits will um, bury their bury their food um, in little stashes, which then may get st stolen by squirrels. Um, and then also the fact that wrens are incredible. Like the, I'm not going to reveal too many of them, but like how many wrens can fit inside a single bird box is pretty ridiculous. Um, so, and having all of these just random cool facts that I was just scrounging together from like my memory banks of uh, reading many, many fact books over the years, because like I didn't read fiction until I was like 10. So my entire life was basically fact books up until that point. And trying to rebuild all of that knowledge and putting it out onto these fact sheets was, it was marvelous. <laughs> I have to, uh, and then putting in like the little size comparison as well. Um, that was like a last minute touch to the book and that one. Uh, I think, you know, one of the traits of our mutual Asperger's is, is that yeah. we probably got quite good memories compared to some people. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore, when we learn facts, we, we keep those. We, we've oh, got yeah. them at our, our, our fingertips, if you like, our mental fingertips for the rest of our lives. And yes. some people sometimes say to me, why do you why do you need to know so much? What 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 is it about knowledge that you find so you know it, it, you know uh, in it, enchanting? What, why do you pursue knowledge all the time? I mean, you could give me a book, though. I don't, but I mean, you could give me a book on how washing machines work, and I, if I had the time, I'd read it, and I'd be you know overjoyed yeah. to learn how a washing machine works. What why why do you think you you know love these facts and love knowing stuff so much? Um, I think. I, I, I love knowledge, sometimes just for the sake of knowledge, almost, because I, don't, I get this like gratification of like knowing, of learning something new and um, that's interesting or cool, that's sort of a bit what you don't expect. Um, getting that little rush of like, I think there, it's, it, I get this little adrenaline rush when I discover something new. And like you said, those facts stick with me for a really, really long time. And like my memory's all over the place. Like sometime, I will not remember what I did last week, uh, but I can remember um, like this random fact about, um, like the sea hair, the fact that they've got the shell, internal shell. I'll remember that in uh, like in 30 years time, I'll still remember that fact. Um, yet I cannot remember what I had for dinner. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I'm only remembering the important stuff, um, but it's like, and, but getting that little rush of like finding out that cool little fact, and then also being able to work with that knowledge to learn how to apply it into stuff like being able to go take a fact and two different facts that seemingly make no sense and then connecting the two of them together, um, is possibly one of the best feelings I can generally get because it it invigorates me to find out uh, to try and find out all of the other connections like it's one thing to remember a fact but it's also then to get that fact and then put it into sort of the puzzle of nature in a sense and you know what you, you've you've said exactly what I, I always justify the, the question with and that is for me knowledge gives context Yes. Because you can see the interrelationship between all of the individual facts, whereas information stands isolated. So if you 
don't know when the Battle of Waterloo was, you can obviously these days take your handheld device and you can go onto a search engine and you can find it out in a couple of seconds. Yes. But if you know when the Battle of Waterloo was and you know when the Battle of Trafalgar was and you know when the Charge of the Light Brigade was, Battle of Balaclava, um, all of those things sort of fit together and they give you a much broader picture of what was going on with yeah. British military history at that point in time. Mm. And, you know, and it, for me, it's that it's joy, it's the joining up that yes. is the joy. That, that, that's it, isn't it? Yeah, it's like um, trying to f like go take two completely different facts and then sort of from different even different fields of like um and then trying to join them up together like going okay um, um let me try and think of one up on the spot now this is like <laughs> um so you sort of think about um like you connect how the orbits of the of the moon well that links into tides which links into rock pools which links into the sea hair which links into the shell and then, <laughs> and trying to work out how all of those sort of interlink together is a constant um, struggle and fascination. <laughs> okay, um, just moving on, let, let's um, hope, and I'm sure it will be, uh, it will come to fruition, that young people are, you know, get the book for themselves, they've given it by their parents, guardians, grandparents, whoever it happens to be, and at least some of them have their uh, spark lit by your your beautiful artwork, your beautiful words and enthusiasm. Um, the world that these young people, the world that you have inherited or in the process of inheriting, and you've already got your share of it, obviously, um, is very different than the one that I, I grew into. I didn't have books quite as rich and beautiful as yours. I had my Ladybird books, not to do any disservice to them. They, 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 they did the job for me. Um, but I've got to tell you, Dara, um, you know, hand on heart that I came into a world where there was a lot more wildlife. We were talking about butterflies before we got started and, and you were saying that you were having a good year and I was having a bad year, but compared to my good years, the, the, the science shows that we've lost a, a lot of our, our butterflies. Um, you know, another part of the message at the end of the book is, is, is telling young people to do something about this, isn't it? Yeah, it's sort of the the ending message of the book like i'm just looking back at it and again it was sort of um i like i remember the the last message of the book because it was the last thing that i wrote um for it. it's it was very little um edited it was just trying to put all of my uh love of the natural world and also my desire to have people take an interest in and realize how beautiful it is but also how in danger it is and also um how to enjoy it in a and how to not how to enjoy it that's ridiculous um but how to not damage it in a sense um while we're out in nature because originally um it was sort of going to be like a um like I remember the original idea for the ending of the book was sort of like a sort of like nature code sort of thing. That idea got trashed immediately because I hated bringing up like any sort of rules. And then I was just like, well, what if I just tell them to love nature in, in paragraphs, uh, essentially? And it was, I remember writing it and just thinking that this book, like it's, all of the childish passion that I had felt in for many, many years, um, I sort of tried to condense it down and down and down into something that could be read. Um, because um, obviously, you can hard I couldn't get everything in about that childish love of the natural world. But then, trying to put it down into that final, that final little bit of prose was something I really really enjoyed and there's the beginning of the of the beginning of the end of the book uh hello again wild child sort of bringing you um a little bit um closer and trying to like just it, it was it was a magical thing to like i've never like there's only a few times when writing something that i you get that sense of what writing the magic of actually putting something in to words was I like I've only experienced it a few times that intense and it's the reason why I love writing 
and that was the last section was something that really did that for me yeah and, and visually again you know uh, here uh, barry's done a great job because oh, at, barry's, at the well, i remember beginning... when this came in that that image at the at the very end was the last was i think it was like the very last piece of artwork that was sent in like it was like we were like uh, it was like weeks away from the deadline it was like the last mad rush to the end and then that came in and it was just like wow it was like all of the culmination of this entire book put into one image so props to barry he's insane uh getting not just every single detail of the book into like basically one beautiful beautiful image i've actually got like a i think i've got like a, a copy of it behind me um, yeah. well i mean at the beginning of the book the child is a gray silhouette yes moving the chair by the end of the book here the child is filled with nature uh, yes. as they've been on your journey through you know the various mm. um exploring the various habitats in a physical yes. sense i.e going to the mountains going to the the, the seashore and, uh, and so forth all the things they've done the pond yes. dipping um uh, so on and so forth the moth trapping uh, all the other things that you suggest that yeah. they, they get on with um and and they you know they, they've now got nature inside them that's what the illustration says so obviously and clearly isn't it yeah it, it like it was just like honestly i was like um my my entire family were like almost in tears by by like i've never been moved by a piece of artwork i feel like it moves me um quite a bit because like i wrote i i put so much effort into this book like i put a, i put a lot of like uh, like my heart and soul into this book of trying to like put all of that wondering and then seeing it all all there in one like sort of eye breath like seeing it all there was just insane um i don't like i actually do have put um someone in the q a asked if there's posters of it i actually do have posters of it somewhere around the house um uh, oh, you shouldn't have said that because now there'll be people sending you stamped addressed envelopes and you'll spend all your time down the post office. Oh, um, no. I'll tell you what, we've got, <laughs> we've got about 10 minutes left and, and there are some questions that have yes. been um, here. So let me open the little question thing and okay. see what we've got. Um, so Carla has said, um, my son Roy, who's nine, has recently been diagnosed with autism and it's helped him understand why he feels things so intensely. Um, I think that, again, without... Yeah you know, going too far into the autism. Um, yeah. I, uh, some people have described it as a superpower. I sometimes will, you know, nudge towards describing it as a gift, but one that sometimes when you open, you don't get what you want. Yeah. So there are pros and cons. Uh, for me, the, the pros include sort of what we might call, relatively speaking, hypersensitivity. You, you spoke at the very outset, Dara, about the detail that yeah. you see when you look at things. And, and that is an asset if you're a naturalist, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It, it definitely is a NASA being able to notice all of the little things. And like, my eyesight isn't really that good. Like, I, I can't really see something unless it moves. So I've got to look really, really close into stuff. Um, and like, and trying to then notice all of those details became like a real pastime of me because I can't really do like, um, it was the way that I interact with nature. I couldn't, I couldn't do like um, serious birding or anything because of that. Like I'm, like I'm colorblind. It's it's hard to see um, <laughs> brown on brown birds. Um, but then trying to focus on all of those little details was that massive thing for me, of trying to notice all of those little things. That was really what got me entranced by the natural world. Okay, next one here. Um, quick one, this one. Um, where is your favourite place to see wildlife? And that's from Roy, who's aged nine, and his mum, Carla. Roy is the uh, young young man who's just been diagnosed with Asperger's. Yeah. So where's your favourite place? Um, so I've just moved house. And so at the moment, I'm living by the coast. And I saw the sea here. So at the moment, it is the coast. Like, it's probably going to change if I see something cool somewhere else. <laughs> but at the moment, it is very much the coast. <laughs> Okay, one here. The way children uh, play is very different nowadays. They spend a lot of time on devices with screens and not outside. Do you think this is going to change in the future? And do you think that governments should try to limit screen time to get children out into nature? Um, I, I'm very against the idea of governments limiting screen time. That's just ridiculous to me. Um, so I think that we've got to realise that screens... They're part of everyday living at this point. It's 
just a matter of fact of life at this point. So we can't really just have governments like saying, well, people do work on their screens. So can we really limit that? And like, so I, I'm against the idea of any government limiting on that at all. Um, and I do think that people will probably get on into nature more in the future, maybe. Like, it's hard to really be an oracle. Um, I hope that people get on into nature more in the future. Um, it's an incredible place. And that has so much beauty to discover. And that's why I hoped to do with my book. Um, but then I think uh, putting all of this, I feel, I feel like there's been a, this massive drive against the against what why well, here's the, the screen um when in reality we should be probably just trying to sort of hybridize them in our well, lives because look, look at this tower so yeah. I'm, I'm about to be talking about the big butterfly count yeah oh uh, yes <laughs> you know <laughs> and, and, and and it's on my device and in fact yeah. you can you can still down, download a hard copy i've got a hard copy here somewhere if you like you know here it is um, so you can you can print it off if you want yeah. on a piece of paper. But lots of people are going to be doing this great piece of citizen science this year on their device. I, I, yeah, I it's it's like it's it's such a useful piece of technology that we can't really discount it. Okay, um, so that's all. I'm going right. to I'm gonna move on because I'm going to yeah. ask an, a, a, another one here. So Lynn Clooney has asked a tricky question this month. We stayed at a place with so many house martens nests. It looked like the adults were feeding multiple nests. Is this something they do, or was it because we, they were flying so fast we lost track of which bird belonged to which nest? Well, um, the trickiness is in how polite you can be to Lynn, <laughs> because um, quite clearly I, they don't I, feed I, other birds young. They don't <laughs> feed other birds. Uh, how smart their own. They, they all sort of look the same and they do fly in a lot of dizzying flight paths so most likely they, they're probably going to the same nest again and again and you lost track of them <laughs> yeah, here we are okay yeah. next one um we've got a few minutes left greta uh, thunberg is another passionate young person who's raising awareness of the environment she did it through a school strike as a young person how did you first manage to emerge and get your voice heard publicly in this way well i wrote a blog and i did that about i started that about five years ago so that would be before the climate strikes and i just kept on writing for i've been I just kept on writing, basically, um, until I started writing Diary. Then I wrote Wild Child, and writing sort of been how I've gotten basically everywhere. It's it's just sort of what I've what I've done. I, I emerged through writing, and I'll probably crash and burn through writing. Well, let's not hope that happens at any point in the near future. You can save that for another seventy years if you don't mind. <laughs> So we've got an anonymous attendee here, and I think it's the same person that's put three questions in. Um, they are a young autistic person, and they have got a couple of questions. So let's try and get through a, a couple of those. What is it about being in nature that is so revitalizing and important and special when you're autistic? Um, so basically, it's the place where I feel most calm and at peace. So I go out there and I embrace myself in all of these these details I see around me and it basically just helps me think about um off the rush of daily life which is pretty stressful and it helps me sort of cope um with um like the human world is just a barrage of um you know, sensory overloads but out in nature it's probably just the way that the colors are the fact that we probably spend most of human history out in nature and it's just a place where I feel most comfortable. Um, I can relate to that. Another one here, um, Tom. Uh, Tom is 10 years old and also autistic. And he says his favorite animal is an okapi. And I can relate to that. Okapis are beautiful animals. Of are. course, I've only seen them in captivity. Um, lovely luster on their pelage. And also they've got this extraordinarily long, uh, flexible tongue related to the giraffe, of course. Anyway, ir irrelevant um, information. Uh, the, what Tom wants to know, Dara, is what is your favorite animal? Difficult, probably the most difficult question. That's probably the, the most difficult question, but I'm going to have to say the hen harrier. It's all, um, it usually changes, um, but I'm going to go with hen harrier because that's the most steady one. Um, like it's probably if I was to ask in the moment, it would be the sea hare at the moment. Um, but I'm I'm gonna go with um 
Hen Harrow out of um, sort of um, my my base. <laughs> okay. Um, Hen Harrow, fantastic birds, yeah. of course. Um, Eve here, who is 12 years old, has said, um, did you consider any other form of art to express your love of nature or was it always going to be writing? Um, I did try a few other things. I tried uh, painting. I don't. Um, I tried music. I sounded like a squeaking cat. Um, although I am trying to relearn how to play guitar um, after many years because I felt kind of like I've got I, I've got to learn an instrument at some point. Like uh, I, I'm Irish. It's like sort of in our blood. Uh, so I've got to learn an instrument at some point. So I'm sort of diving back into it. But writing was the one that I, I needed to do some sort of art form. And writing was just the one that I ended up settling on. I did try all of them. Um, but I did drop out of art, so <laughs> it's <laughs> dropped out of art. I, I don't know yeah, that's that. a that's a difficult one. <laughs> okay, um, there's another question here from Penny, who's nine years old, and she says, "I'm visually impaired, and I love nature and birds in particular. Do you have any tips to help me enjoy nature best?" Um, so I would generally say, like, use all, like, um, stay in one place. Um, like, I, I am, I do have a few eye problems myself and like not be able to differentiate certain colors and stuff um which is annoyingly annoyingly yellow and green um which is like <laughs> most of nature um so well what i tend to do is i look at one thing really really closely or i listen in um, a lot or i i smell um or taste um use all of the other senses that i usually can try to avail to myself um to try and get a better picture of the of the world um okay and then there's someone here who is this patience perry and patience has said please show us a picture of a sea hare i want to go and find one now well i've just looked it up that there, there yeah. we are patience there, there you go you i did get it. a picture of one but it, you can hardly see it um, and that's not my photo there. that's one i found on a search engine i'm afraid um very, now, very i think that one's the non-native one yeah this isn't a native one it's an american yeah. one i think yeah so I, was, I was rushing it's, it's a lot more brown and it's a little bit more elongated so. yeah okay um, okay i think we've got time for one more Dara, if we're quick with it um andrew uh hugill huggill here has said um perhaps a project about sounds next or autistic people like myself hear lots of details too which is true enough of course but um I'm very visually orientated. Um, I, 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 you know, I don't know about you. My acoustic sensitivity is not quite so developed as my visual one. H how does that fit with you, Dara? Um, I'm probably a little bit more visual, even with like. Couple I mean, I am asking a young man wearing a Ramones T-shirt, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. My ears have, uh, my ears are, are. That's probably the reason why my ears um, exactly. are not. So good. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Many, many a time, absolutely blasting my eardrums, which any doctor would probably squirm at if they saw the decibel levels going into my eardrums. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> so I, that's probably why I, I generally end up being a little bit more visual, even if because I can, I like looking at stuff really, really close. Um, and if I do get to hear it, <laughs> it's. Um, it, it's sort of like a supplement to the sites. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've got to bring it to a close. We could chat yeah. on for hours. I'm sure you and I yeah. could get into all those devilish details, which interest us so, so much. And um, there's always something tickling our natural history fancy. Um, what we'd like to tickle yours is Star's book, of course. Um, here it is, as I said, published on uh, Ju July the 8th. So it's in all good bookshops and it's available from Waterstones. As I said earlier, there are uh, a few signed copies still within the uh, Waterstones repository. So if you would like one of those, then you need to order quickly. Other than that, uh, do what you can to get your hands on one of these uh, very, very beautiful books. I mean, I, I hate to say this because it's one of those sort of cheesy things that people say at Christmas. But this, uh, when I was one year old and i know that i only know this because of what's written in 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 the uh, frontispiece of the book my grandmother uh, bought me two bird books and uh, it says happy birthday 1962 so i was one year old when i got them and without a word of a lie i can remember every single illustration in those two bird books that my grandmother 
bought me. Now, I'm not saying I can remember it from when I was one year old, but by the time I was four, I was looking at those books every single day. And sometimes a book is not just about pages and paper and, and the beautiful paintings that have been done in here to support uh, Dower's uh, beautiful prose and, and all of his thought and effort and energy. Um, they're about an, an entity. This book is an entity. This book exists. I can smell it. It's got a unique smell. And, and I think that if you were to give this to a young person, perhaps on their first birthday, um, then they might cherish this and, and remember all of those beautiful illustrations that are in here in the same way as I do those two bird books that my grandmother bought me way back in 1962. And, and that's why I still like I still like books. I like the physical book. I mean, I don't do downloads, all those sorts of things. I, I like a physical book that I can pick up, that I can touch, I can feel. And I'm feeling it now, and I can tell you it feels great as well. Um, so there we are. Yeah. Um, do try to get your hands on uh, one of these fantastic books. Dara, thanks so much for joining us this evening, answering everyone's questions and revealing the, you know, some honest insights into what motivates you and what motivated you to produce this, this lovely book. Um, I've got to go and talk about launching the Big Butterfly Count, which starts tomorrow. Uh, it's run by Butterfly Conservation. I've got to use this as a platform to plug it, obviously, and I'm sure Dara won't mind. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. You've got to do, you, well, you'll be doing it. Oh, I'm, sure you'll, I'm sure you'll be doing it. And Judging by the number of butterflies you were bragging about earlier, you're going to blow everyone else aside. Um, so we need 15 minutes of your time in the next three weeks to stand in one place and count a number of butterflies. There are 20 different species. You can download the app or you can get the sheet at uh, uh, butterflycount.com org and um and all that data is really useful to us because obviously if we know where they are if we know where they're not and we know where they've moved to we can conserve them better in the future so for me chris packham um i'd like to say good night and dara you're going to sign off yep and from dara goodbye <laughs>